Welcome back. Today we're going to be delving into chapter three. We're going to be talking about tools of the laboratory um, and, you know, growing up bacterial cultures and all that sort of stuff. But I could not resist to put this picture up. It's on my lecture for like the in-person lecture. And I didn't want you guys to miss out, you know. Um, this is my little pup and um, her name is Ripley and she is the best. So um, obviously, hard to click on that. And then this is where I'm actually getting it to work correctly this time. <laughs> Third time's a charm, right, guys? Um, but yeah, so anyways, yeah, she's the best one for sure. She's pretty old now. I don't know how old, but she's got white to her little face now. So pretty cute. That's correct. Okay. <laughs> All right. So like I said, tools of the lab, um, we are, let's see if I can move this. Yes, I can. Cool. Okay. The things we're going to touch on, on this chapter, we're going to talk about the five eyes. You'll know what it means whenever you learn it in this chapter today. Um, defining selective media versus differential, which is a very important distinction. And you will have to know that on exams, both in um, the lecture as well as in the lab. Um, techniques for isolating the microbes. Um, when you have like just a whole mess of microbes going together, how do you get them like into one exact microbe? Like how do you know you're just growing the one microbe and not just a whole mix? Um, the path of the light in a microscope and how it magnifies um, light versus electron microscopy in the three main categories of stains. Um, the stains you're going to become very familiar with in the lab. If you don't become familiar with them in the beginning part of the lab, um, you will be very familiar with them at the um, second half whenever we're doing all of our um, unknown investigation and all this, because we're putting all of this chapter three stuff basically to work in that. So um, yeah, fun. So the five eyes, we have inoculation, incubation, isolation, inspection, and identification. It's important to distinguish between the five eyes so that you know what is going on in each step and what should be happening in you know, the whole uh, stepwise manner of investigating, trying to figure out what an organism is. So we're gonna start and go down the whole line. So we'll start with inoculation. For, this is involving producing a culture. So you have a sterile media of some kind, just like a sterile broth that we've made sterile by autoclaving it. And you'll know what autoclaving is soon. It uses heat um, and pressure and moisture to kill every single thing in there. So it makes things sterile that way. They use them a lot in hospitals and a ton in like micro, uh, microbiology type labs. So um, that's a very useful tool to be aware of. So anyways, you take a sterile media of some kind and you basically like take a sample from something and then you boop, inoculate. That's what that means. We're introducing microorganisms to a sterile media so that we can grow them up. So what is a culture? It is literally talking about cultivation of microorganisms, growing up microorganisms. Um, any growth that appears, uh, it refers to any growth that appears on or in the broth after some sort of incubation period. So you inoculate and then um, you're gonna incubate right after, which we'll talk about right next in the next slide um, <clears throat> and what that means. Um, but yeah, and then you can like look at it and pretty much look at it and tell whether it's turbid, which is like a cloudiness. Um, and that usually means that there's bacteria growing in there. Um, medium is the singular media is the plural. I'm not going to get too picky about you guys using the correct terms over it because I almost never do. So I don't want to be a hypocrite there. <clears throat> as long as you know the, what the concept is, that's what's important. So it's a nutrient containing environment for microbes to multiply. When we talk about inoculating, we're literally, like I said, introducing, um, microbes into a culture, usually a sterile culture in order to get them to multiply and grow so we can study and investigate them. And sterile is a term that refers to being free of all microbes. There are some versions of microbes that are very, very hardy. Like if you think about like anthrax and they put that powder in the envelopes and whatever, that's because it's a very hardy bacteria. It develops something called endospores. Endospores can survive, they're made to survive extremely hard, harsh conditions like um, dryness, uh, lack of food, um, radiation and all sorts of stuff like that. So, 
Um, but yeah, even even um, those will be killed by by sterilization. They should be dead too. So we need that for anything where we are using that instrument for um, like medical purposes, or if we're going to be sampling or trying to get a single organism to grow, you need something to be sterile from the get go. All right, talking about incubation next. Um, that so. Typically when you're trying to grow microorganisms, you take a sample from wherever, like the bottom of your shoe or the back of your throat, if you're sick or something like that, and you're trying to get that bacteria to grow somewhere, the usual temperatures for most things that we're sampling is 20 to 40 degrees Celsius. That's approximately room temperature up to a little higher than body temperature. So um, that's what we would call like that middle, middle of the road type of a temperature. They do have a term for these kinds of bacteria. It's called mesophile. That's the temperature, referring to the temperature, which is literally like that middle temperature range. Um, just, you'll need to know it later on, we'll talk about it, but yeah, that is what these organisms typically are. Most of the time they're gonna be mesophiles. They're gonna grow in that 20 to 40 degrees Celsius range. Um, the incubators, we can also, when we're growing them, control how much like you know oxygen or carbon dioxide or other atmospheric gases are being introduced into that incubator to make that organism as happy as possible while it's growing. Um, we can grow things uh, when we're having them on a, a liquid, we can grow things and see if they are turbid, like a cloudiness, if they develop a sediment at the bottom, maybe a scum at the top or along the edges and might have a change in the color that will, all of that would indicate that there was growth happening in there. And we can also tell on solid medium if there are visible masses of piled up cells, which we call colonies. A colony, a single colony, typically comes from a single bacterial cell. All right. Um, this is just uh, referring to the growth times that um, some of these bacteria might uh, undergo in order to like double up and grow enough bacteria for you to actually be able to work with them. Uh, if we are talking about listeria, which is a common um, food pathogen, um, it, optimal temperature growth is 25 to 30 degrees Celsius. Body temperature is 37. <clears throat> Just FYI, my nose is really stuffy. I apologize. Um, and then culturing was going to take about one to two days for it to grow. Pretty typical growth time for most bacteria. Um, if you look down here at the mycobacterium, we have mycobacterium tuberculosis and mycobacterium leprae which obviously um, the tuberculosis one causes tuberculosis, the leprae one causes leprosy, but these are very slow growing uh, bacteria. So it would take about 28 days to culture the tuberculosis one. And then we get a little star down here for the leprosy saying that even though, even though we can't culture it in vitro, we have to grow it in the animal model. Um, it has one of the longest doubling times, which is 14 days of any known bacterium. This takes a very long time to grow. Um, so what kind of media would we be working with? Um, we, you want to try, if you're trying to grow up a whole, like a uh, sample that you don't know what it is, you might want to use a pretty generalized media, but if you do know what it is and you want to keep other things from contaminating it, you might want to use a media that is specific for that organism. And we have things like that available for a lot of different organisms. So some microbes out there only require a few simple compounds for growth. They're not very, um, they're not going to be very picky. Other microbes require complex organic and inorganic nutrients. And then certain ones can't not be grown on artificial laboratory media and require cell cultures or even host animals like that mycobacterium leprosy, lepra, lepra. Yeah, you know what I mean. Um, we have to use sterile technique to inoculate. So when we're introducing bacteria into our media um, and then going on to incubating it, uh, we have to have sterile tools because otherwise you're just passing on bacteria back and forth over and over again. And you'll learn about this in the laboratory. If you have not already, um, you will be introducing your little loop, uh, metal loop into the flame to sterilize it as much as possible and burn off everything that's on there. And then you will use that to get samples and then um, inoculate. And then you'll have to burn it again if you don't want to contaminate the next thing. So that's the idea with that. So you take um, measures uh, to prevent introduction of non-sterile materials into the media. That's referring to aseptic technique. <clears throat> so aseptic technique uh, versus sterile. 
um, is what this is talking about. So sterile, yeah, so I guess I should back it up a little bit. Um, in the lab, we'll be trying to sterilize our stuff as much as possible. It is what we call aseptic technique to prevent things from contaminating, whereas sterile technique, you're trying to keep it sterile, keep it completely sterile. So that's a little bit of a difference there, but um, they, they do fall in the same category. And here's just the same concept. We'll get into the terms of and the differences later on, of course, well, in the lab mostly, but okay. Types of media, um, liquid, solid, <laughs> Uh, whether there it's defined or synthetic, like you know exactly what is in there versus the complex type of media where it's not, it's just like, like you put a like literally dried broth uh, powder in there and mixed it in there and you don't really know exactly the composition of it. And it's not important because the bacteria is not going to be that picky. Um, and then you might want your media to do a variety of things. So when we look over here in the functional types of media, there's these eight different kinds general purpose media, you just want to need to grow it up. Enriched, you're trying to um, grow up the specific thing to make it particularly happy. Selective, you're trying to grow up a specific thing only and not other things. Um, differential, where you're trying to tell the difference between things that are growing in your sample um, and whether or not it produces a certain thing like a byproduct when it uses this thing as opposed to this thing. Um, anaerobic growth, that just means an aerobic means no, an means no, aero means air, so no air growth. So it just means growing without oxygen. Uh, specimen transport, you might want it to be a little bit more stable. Um, you don't want to be swishing around all your stuff everywhere if you're trying to transport it. Um, and then whether it's for a specific assay, you might need a specific media for that. And then enumeration, some types of media are better for counting out or um, literally determining how many cells are in a solution than other media might be. All right, the physical states of media, like we were saying, you could have liquid, you could have semi-solid, you can have a solid media. So um, to keep things solid, we use something called auger. It's a complex polysaccharide from red algae. Auger comes from algae. It is to solidify the actual media. Um, it is solid at room temperature. It liquefies at 100 degrees Celsius. Once it is liquefied, it does not begin to solidify until it cools to about 42 degrees Celsius. Um, so once you are at that point and you're ready to uh, start pouring your you know, plates out at about you know, that 42 degrees, area is a lot cooler and you can actually handle it. It's not going to like burn you for the most part um, or anything like that. It's just be nice and warm. Um, anything from one to 5% auger in your media is usually what we would call it auger. So whether we're talking about nutrient auger or something like that, or, you know, citrate auger, that it has to do with how much of it is actually in there, whether we can actually call it that. What might you use these things for? Well, general purpose media is for broad spectrum. Complex um, includes a wide variety of um, mixture of ingredients for a wide variety of life. We have enriched media. That is for things that require very specific growth factors. They can't make things to survive. They need their environment to provide it for them. So that's the idea with a growth factor, okay? Uh, it could be a vitamin. It could be amino acids. It could be non-organic substances as well. So anything we would call fastidious, that just means that it has a, a requirement for growth that is greater than like what the general growth type of organism would need. It's a little more picky. It requires more, it's more bougie. All right, selective versus differential. Uh, well, right, so we wanna know, um, we have a mixture of things. We might wanna know um, what the differences are, or we might wanna keep certain things from growing and other things we want them to grow up more. So that's what this media is for. Selective, these are two different kinds. I wanna be clear about that. Selective and differential, okay? Um, both of these have extensive applications in isolation and isolation identification. Um, they are used for pre preliminary identification. Examples of this would be McConkie auger, staphylococcal media, and blood auger. These are, um, not everything will grow on these things. And um, some of them will have color changes or some sort of other aspect of change to that media that allows us to tell if that um, organism, you know, either can or cannot grow on the media or 
it can or cannot utilize the things that are in there and then change it to a substance that allows us to visualize the color change or um, whatever, or the halo or whatever. We'll be learning a lot about this in the lab. So selective media is here on the left. Uh, we have a mixed sample. It's got a lot of different kinds of bacteria in it here on the left. Um, we played it out on just a regular old plate and you see we get all these different types of bacteria. We played it on our selective media that selects for that specific organism. Only one type of organism can grow on it. Now we only grow that organism. Now we can start to move on with our other tests on that organism. We now know it is a, you know, um, listeria of some kind. Well, which kind of listeria? Is it listeria monocytogenes or it is listeria something else? So that's an idea there. Um, Another uh, use, we have uh, the differential media here on the right. So you can see here, we have the same growth pattern on both of these. Everything can grow on both. It's just on this right one, on this differential medium, these um, are reacting in different ways to that medium. So some of them turn blue, some of them turn red, some of them are just white. And so based on their color change, we might say, well, it turned this particular part of the media into an acid it caused a pH change and that changed that color indicator to this, or uh, that turned it into uh, alkaline, a base. It made a higher pH. So now it turned that indicator to this color. It's a different color. So often that's the case with a lot of the um, uh, media that they would use for differential situations. Um, yeah, so these are examples of selective media and their additives that will inhibit the growth of some microbes. Some ones that we might wanna be familiar with are like McConkie auger. McConkie auger has crystal violet and um, bile in there. So you're gonna grow gram negative enteric. So things that grow in your gut are gonna grow on this. Other things might not be able to survive that. When we talk about um, like mannitol salt auger, it has salt in it, that's its selective agent. Um, not everything can grow in that high of salt, but Staphylococcus can. And so we can isolate Staphylococcus species this way. Um, we can either isolate them. Um, some of them even produce an acid byproduct that turn it a different color. So we can determine things about it based on that. There's a lot of different media. This is not even the tip of the iceberg. All right, differential media. They have an additive that responds to a change in the medium. What does that mean? That means that organism like used a sugar, it processed that sugar and it made an acid byproduct like we were just talking about. And then that acid byproduct that collects in the media changes something in that media, usually a color indicator into a different color because the acid is present, right? That's very common. So there's other things that can happen that can change um, media color. So this is a chrome auger. Uh, down here at the bottom, the different bacteria uh, written out, you know, real cute, like on there and how they have changed the color of the auger um, per each species that you look at. So E. coli, Klebsiella, uh, Proteus, uh, Enterococcus, um, Saprophyticus, and uh, I think that's Salmonella, it could be Strep. I don't know for sure. I don't know all of them, but I know that S. aureus is Staphylococcus aureus. So um, whatever, but uh, whether or not there's a color change can help you determine if they make this byproduct or not. And if you don't know much about that organism, you're just trying to figure out what it is and it does grow on this thing and make acid. There are charts you can look at that say, okay, if it made acid here, then we go this way on the chart. And if it made acid on the next type of a media, then it utilized this other thing. So then we go this way on the chart. And if it made this sort of byproduct in this test, so on and so forth, now we can say that it is, you know, E. coli or whatever. All right, other differential media, we've got blood auger. Uh, most things can grow on this. Um, it's an enrichment medium for fastidious microbes as well as a differential media. So some things require certain things in their media, those growth factors that we were talking about before. Um, this will supply that, but it'll also allow us to determine if this organism is hemolyzing. And what is hemolysis? That means we are breaking down red blood cells. If we are breaking down red blood cells, we can see a change in the red blood cells in this auger. So it's a blood auger. There's red blood cells. We're breaking them down. There's three types of hemolysis to be aware of. Do be aware of the differences. We have beta hemolysis, which is complete lysis. 
So this is a very good picture because it has a beta written out here. I can't really see my writing, but whatever. Um, alpha hemolysis. Um, you can see that there is a change going on here. We did hemolyze, but we don't have that halo. It's not complete hemolysis. So beta is complete. Alpha is you got some, but it's not complete. And then gamma hemolysis. I don't know why we call it hemolysis, but gamma hemolysis means you did not hemolyze. I don't know why it's called it, but that is, there it is. I'm sure there's a reason. I'm sure someone's going to tell me and I don't care, but that's the words you need to know. Um, so if we have a medium that contains a compound that inhibits some microbes from growing, what would we call that media? So our choices here, we have differential medium, selective medium, enrichment, nutrient, and carbohydrate. Well, if we are inhibiting some microbes, that means that um, it is selective because then some microbes would be able to grow. So that's what my guess is going to be. We're going to put in B. We're going to click through. So I said selective and I was correct. Go figure. And then moving on. So um, we've done our inoculation. So I made our little list. Uh, no worries. I have it written down here. So um, I have our inoculation. This is probably backwards to you guys. And I'm sorry, I can't write backwards, but um, inoculation and then incubation. So now we are on isolation. Cool. So how now, okay. If I swab my foot and I put it into uh, media, it's probably gonna have more than one bacteria in it, right? I mean, to be fair, especially if we've been walking around without shoes on, been taking the dog out, maybe step, step in the poop or whatever. And now, um, even if I wash it off, I'm probably still gonna have a not very good job of it. Still walking around in my house, which probably is also dirty because I had walked the, the freaking bathtub somehow, right? I didn't hop there probably on one foot or maybe I got both foot dirty. It doesn't matter. It's gross. So feet are gross. So that's the point. You swab your feet, you put it on um, an auger or in a broth and it grows up and you probably have multiple bacteria growing, right? Not just one kind, just multiple kinds. Okay. How do you separate them? That's what we're talking about with isolation. This is the procedures that we would use to try to isolate those organisms from one another. So we got a mixture of our sample here. We got our feet, we swabbed them, we grew them and we have a mixture. So now we're going to have to separate these we can dilute them. So literally just keep watering them out. And eventually you'll plate it and get just like one or two colonies. And that's the goal, right? Cause I told you earlier, if you were paying attention, what's a colony, a colony grows up from one cell. So if a colony grows up from one cell and it's like nice and good, and you can go in there with your little loop and touch on it, that's one bacterial species. You can make a pure culture with that. Pure culture is a culture that's from one bacterial known bacterial species. So um, we can divide it out by diluting it if we need to, and then plating it out and growing it on our, you know, nutrient plates or whatever to get individual colonies. So um, we dilute it out. We separate the cells out more and more as we dilute them, depending on the dilutions and you might need several. Um, and then we grow each one out. And then you can see that um, these microbes come visible as isolated colonies. Each colony is one individual microbe. You can even plate them together um, in separate areas, preferably if you're trying to separate them, but that's the idea, right? So you can grow up individual colonies that represent one bacterial organism. So what is a colony? Like we said, it's a discrete amount of cells formed on a solid, nutrient surface. You can't make them in liquid, right? They had to make their little mound of cells. It's one cell multiplying and multiplying and multiplying over and over again to create that mound. It's one species, no other species. It's formed from a single cell. Now you, if you were analyzing all this and you were looking at these ones that are sort of touching like three and four over here, um, you might be concerned that they could be overgrowing one another and kind of mixing in. And I would be, I would be concerned about that. Um, so if you're trying to isolate, those might not be the ones that you want to go for. So you want to go for, um, you know, one of the ones that are isolated, like this number four out here, or this number three here, they're by themselves. They're not touching anything else. We got the number seven out here. You get the idea. Okay. So this is one way that we can isolate. 
This is the streak plate. This is probably the most important thing that you're going to learn. Not the most important thing that you're going to learn. One of the most important techniques that you're going to learn for the lab, as far as isolating out things, um, you're going to do this on your own if you haven't already. So essentially what you do is you have a plate and let's say, um, you know, we swab my foot. We, that was our, that was we take our swab and we inoculate a uh, sterile broth, right? Then we incubate that broth. So now we're ready to go on to our isolation step. So we've grown up whatever mixture we have going on here. We're ready to isolate. So what do we do? We take our sterile loop that we flamed into the broth and then we swipe it up real good. I'm not very going to be very good at drawing this. I'm so sorry with this friggin uh, mouse pad, but whatever you put it in our first area, you just lay it down. That's the idea there. It doesn't matter if you go back and forth or whatever, you're just going to lay it down real good. So that's that, um, that one area, the first area, right? So that's step number one, step number two is, um, the second one. So we're going to flame our loop. So it's sterile again, then pull it through maybe a couple times and then we'll go back four. It should be a nice zigzag. You shouldn't be going back on it like I did, but yeah. So then you'll flame it again. This is past number three, two. Well, it's our third quadrant. So we did, this is our lay down. This was our first pass through uh, quadrant number two. This is our second pass through. This is quadrant number three. And then flame it again. And then you do this, right? And then you just squiggle it out to whatever that open area is. And that is quadrant four. And that quadrant, the fourth quadrant, is where you're going to get your individual colonies, as you can see here. Now you can see that there are different types of bacteria growing up, just quite visibly. You can take a few of them and inoculate some um, media with them, maybe a yellow and a red and uh, a white, and go inoculate some media and grow them up and do other tests to determine what each of them are. But now, if you take it just from that one colony and grow up a new sterile culture from that, like you start with a sterile media, put that one colony, into that and then grow it up again, then you can do your tests on that one type of bacteria and analyze it. So that's the streak plate method, okay? The next one is loop dilution. This is not really one that I do a whole lot of, but it's basically like inoculating a culture. If you were to plate it, it would have a lot of growth on it, but you can take, you know, after you've inoculated it, take a sample from it and inoculate another one. It's taking less and less bacteria essentially in every step. Um, eventually one of them will only grow out single colonies and you can actually use them to do your analyses with to get them separated out, right? A better picture I feel like of that situation is when you look at the actual like, um, like liquid dilution idea of this. So this, if you're trying to dilute things out like um, with a mill, so you take your original sample and put a milliliter of it into a media that's a one to 10 dilution and you were to plate it, it's like a mess, right? You take a mill of that and plate it and then we're starting to make some progress. We're starting to get some separation and whatever. So then we get into this plate. I'd probably go with this plate, but you could go with this plate. Um, now you have an individual colonies that you can work with. So you had to dilute it out to the 10,000 or 100,000 and that's fine. It's um, one to 10 versus um, one to 100,000. And it doesn't take that much work for you to dilute it out that much. Just putting a mill of one into a mill and then uh, into nine mils of another, mix it, take a mill of that, put it into, and so on and so forth. Did this a lot at my previous job, <laughs> did this a lot. So um, that's the idea there. Um, and then you, when I say you played it, what I mean is I show it down here, this a spread plate, you would just take another, just one mil of it, an amount of it, squirt it onto a auger, auger like solid plate that you can grow on and just like spread it out either with the hockey stick, the sterile hockey stick, or um, you can just let it spread on its own and um, then grow it and then see um, what it looks like when it grows. Okay. <clears throat> so this is what you could get as a result of your attempts to isolate. You might, might result in a pure culture where we've got the white, the yellow and the red here. We could have a mixed culture. So you think you isolated it, you spread it out and you've actually got the yellow and the white on there still. You still need to undergo another round of isolation or uh, maybe you did essentially isolate it but is contaminated with something from the environment and now you might not be able to use it still. So those are some problems that could go uh, on with a uh, isolation. So we've isolated, we've got our single things. 
Now, what do we do with them in order to figure out whatever we are trying to study? The next step is inspection and then identification, which I just, I wrote it like it's a long word. You can clearly see that, but like, um, so it's our next steps that kind of go a little bit hand in hand. Um, we use a lot of in the lab, we'll be using biochemical tests and stains in order to answer these questions. So biochemical tests can determine fundamental characteristics like nutrient requirements. Um, can they or can they not grow um, whenever they're given only citrate, right? Um, some of them can, you know, can't grow with only citrate. They need other stuff. Um, can they grow um, in the presence of, you know, salts? and everything like that. So nutrient requirements, products made during growth, like the acid production as a byproduct, breaking something down, producing certain enzymes that can react with other things that are in the media that show us a color change or something like that. Um, and then mechanisms that are for deriving energy. So that organism can make energy um, in a different way than other organisms. Sometimes we can create a color change from that as well. For example, um, an aerobic, organism, that means it grows in the presence of air, uh, would not produce a hydrogen sulfide gas or hydrogen sulfur sulfide product, a sulfur byproduct, um, as a result of growing in, you know, a stab, meaning you stab it down, you inoculate it, it's going to grow without air. And if it makes H2S, it'll make a black precipitate in some kinds of media that have a special iron indicator in there. The iron reacts with the sulfur, turns it black. And if it does that, and you see that black, that means that your organism is making energy using sulfur instead of oxygen. And we will get more into the actual chemical reactions of that later, which I know you're just overwhelmingly excited about. So um, that's the idea with that. Uh, other analytical and diagnostic tools, genotypic testing, obviously literally looking at their genome using PCR, which is polymerase chain reaction to look at their DNA sequence to compare them. You'll be familiar with PCR, I promise. Um, immunologic testing. So we talked about antibodies. Antibodies are a little protein that your body can make that recognizes a specific bad guy. Okay. Um, like when you get a shot, a flu shot, and your body makes antibodies against um, the flu, that antibody is, is what I'm talking about here. So that is what protects you. It recognizes only the flu. So if I can use antibodies like that and help me determine whether something is the flu or is, you know, coronavirus or something like that, um, that's where that, that's where this immunologic testing can come into play. We can either use the presence of somebody's antibodies against COVID in their blood with a blood test to see if they're making antibodies against COVID, or we can use antibodies that we have against COVID and make a test to see if they have COVID antigen, which is like, um, essentially the thing that the antibody is exactly reacting to about COVID. So that's how those things would work and immunologic testing. We can also inoculate suitable laboratory animals. If we can't do these things in, um, you know, uh, vitro, which is outside of the body in vivo is inside vivo being alive. Okay. So how do we make, how do we determine what's what we have phenotypic testing, looking at like appearance and things like what we see on outwardly genotypic testing, looking at, um, their actual gene genes, their DNA, uh, immunologic testing using antibodies, macroscopic analysis, maybe the color of these uh, colonies, because we already saw some bacteria in the previous pictures, right? That were different colors or shapes where they have like a different texture almost, uh, maybe some of them are shiny or whatever. You can use those things, those aspects as a macroscopic analysis. Um, some of these um, biochemical tests are sort of a macroscopic analysis as well. And then we have microscopic analysis, which is literally what it sounds like. And we are moving on to that next talking about the dimensions of microbes, the smallest bacteria is 200 nanometers. Protozoa and algae are three to four millimeters. Viruses range from 20 to 800 nanometers. So we're talking about something extremely tiny. You can't just see it. Um, when we talk about a millimeter, uh, I guess we're talking about like, if we talk about lice, gross, but um, they're about a millimeter in size. So uh, that puts things into perspective. So we're talking about protozoa and algae. Some of them can be a lot larger. So when we made the microscope, here's some boring stuff. Robert 
um, Hook made some observations of microbes in the 1600s and came up with the idea of the cell, which is that building block of life. Um, Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek, he made a microscope to examine threads and fabrics. I guess he was just interested. We all do weird stuff like that sometimes, especially most of when we were children, but that's okay. We're not judging. Um, he looked at the threads in the fabrics and made drawings what he saw. And he made drawings what he saw in rainwater as well and stuff that he scraped from his teeth and um, had like opinions and made little words up about it of that. But he, he really was like able to start investigating this new world using that magnification. So magnification um, in a microscope, how does it work? We have a clear glass sphere. Um, in most cases, that's enough to magnify most objects. Um, depending on how that is curved, that sphere, that lens, um, the image is enlarged to a certain degree. And we call that the power of magnification. We use X, literally that just means times. So 40 times the size or whatever, okay? 40 X, 100 X, whatever. So that you can see it. So refraction, um, that's a term that refers to uh, the, pen, the bending or the change in the angle of the light ray as it passes through something. Um, such as a lens or just the slide that you're looking at. And you can see in the picture depicted over here on the right, well, we are familiar with this concept. We know that if you shine light through a water that it'll bend, or if you shine light through glass that it'll bend, that's all this is talking about, that's refraction. Okay, the greater the difference between the two substances, the greater the refraction. So if you have, you know, air versus like a, you know, a liquid like soup or whatever, um, that's going to have a larger degree of refraction than like, you know, air and something that is also like more like air and less like, like way less dense than glass even. So, um, it would have to be, you know, a nice, um, other air, other air, I guess, other guess. It wasn't a good example, but what I do have a good example for is this in our microscopes in the lab, we put our samples down on glass, right? So now we're talking about how light passes through glass. If we want to keep our image crisp and clear and able to see it well and reduce refraction, we put oil on at the higher levels of magnification to reduce the refraction because oil and glass are more similar than glass and air. So that's the better example that I should have just started with. This is a microscope and you do have to know the parts, be familiar with them. This is not something that like should be too difficult. I feel like at this point in your life, you understand words and they make sense when you hear them. So that's the idea with this. The arm of the microscope is the part that you're gonna lift it up by. It's just the back piece here. The base down here, you'll put your hand underneath that when you lift it. So pick it up by the arm, put your hand under the base. These are very expensive. Please do not drop them. Um, the ocular or eye piece is up here, obvi. Um, the body is just the whole like part of it that everything else is made up on the nose piece. This part is the part that turns to allow you to select the different objective lenses. The objective lenses are the ones that are right at contact with your specimen. This is the mechanical stage. The stage is where you put your um, slide down so that you can look at it. So it'll stay like nice and secure there and there are clips and stuff on there to keep your slides secure. And if you're unsure how to use them, please ask me. I would rather you ask than mess up my equipment. Um, Substage condensers and uh, aperture diaphragm. So I don't need you to know all these fancy words. So this is the stage. This is the condenser. This is the diaphragm. The condenser is what kind of captures the light from the whatever this light source is down here. Um, so there's a whole other diaphragm on that for some microscopes. I don't think ours has it, but we're more concerned with the diaphragm up here by the uh, condenser. So the substage, meaning below the stage condenser, um, it takes the light and focuses it on to the specimen. Okay. So it focuses the light from underneath up onto the specimen and you can control how much light goes through with the diaphragm underneath. Um, and then you can control the light intensity. There's usually knob. Ours has one on the side, like a little rolling side on the bottom of the, like the base of it. Then you have your coarse adjustment, which is the big knob and the fine adjustment, which is the littler knob on the outside of it. You only use the coarse adjustment on the 4X, please. I will say it again in the lab. Please only use the coarse adjustment on the 4X lens. The other ones you need to be, have already focused on 4X, switched over, and then you use fine to fine tune it. Otherwise you risk breaking the lens as well as the slide and that can cause all sorts of problems. Cool, we did it. 
Oh, and then stage adjustment knobs. There's these little knobs like hanging down on the side. It's not very well depicted in this picture here, um, but uh, there's these little like knobs that hang down on the side that you can like turn and it, it moves the stage around so you don't have to push and pull on the stage itself or the slide. You should be using those knobs underneath to move it side to side and up and forward and back, okay? Light microscopy, that's what we're doing in our lab. There's three properties of an effective microscope. You need magnification, resolution, and contrast. The objective lens is the one close to the specimen that gives you the real image that we're magnifying there. The eyepiece, the eye um, ocular lens, that's closer to your eye, that creates the virtual image. And yes, you do know, need to know which is which and where they come from, okay? This is how magnification works. Essentially, you have a light source. It gets focused down by the condenser onto your specimen here. Then we have an objective lens. The light coming through the specimen will hit the objective lens and focus it here. So it gets focused on and then spread back up towards the ocular lens. This is where the um, virtual image is going to be created as it hits the um, ocular lens, okay? Because we had the original real image happening down here from the actual freaking specimen. That's why it's the real image because it's straight from the specimen. It's passed through another lens and going into another lens. That's the virtual image. It's not direct, okay? That's why it's called that. All right, this is the difference between resolution and resolving power. Um, we're talking about the, the clarity of the image. So the better the resolving power, um, the clearer the image is gonna be. Uh, shorter wavelengths of light typically result in better resolution. That's just because you know it gives you more detail because of those shorter wavelengths. So that makes sense um, when you look at it that way. This isn't gonna cause more um, noise. This is gonna cause less noise because it's almost creating uh, more detail, okay? then this isn't giving you quite as much detail as it gets spread out more. So that's the idea there. Um, right, so resolution and resolving power continued. We've got a low resolution look here and a high resolution look here. I mean, we've said like clarity, right? So the more, um, the higher the resolution, the more clarity. Um, this is now moving on to, this is the picture of fluorescence microscopy cool it glows like that's what fluorescence means yeah so fluorescence is using like labels essentially to mark certain things either certain cells or certain parts of the cell that will fluoresce or literally give off glowing light in certain colors so you can take images and see you know does this have this is this this bacteria if it glows green then it is this bacteria if it doesn't then it's not or whatever that's fluorescence microscopy this is confocal microscopy, this looks at things in layers. So it literally focuses in 3D, like throughout the image and you can take pictures kind of up and down in that image. So if you start on the outside, like I like this picture, a C kind of, um, and then A also is pretty good, but like looking on the outsides of things on the top. And then if you focus in a little bit more, you start to look almost on the insides of these things and get a better view of it. Um, and then you can create 3D images from those. Um, yeah, I mean, that makes sense because I mean, you're looking in and out and you compile all of it and the computer can put it all together and make a 3D image of a thing. Confocal microscopy. Okay, moving on. Oil immersion lenses. A drop of oil will be placed on the slide when using the oil immersion lens. Um, that's the 100X lens in our laboratory, by the way. Um, the oil has the same optical qualities as glass, so that reduces refraction, allowing for increased resolution. The oil prevents scattering of light rays and increases the numerical aperture and the resolution. So it spreads out what you can see, essentially. Um, oil immersion can resolve objects that are 0.2 micrometers apart. Cool. So here is a picture of what's going on with that. Essentially, you have light coming out from uh, the condenser and shining up through the specimen, through the slide, the light is going to get scattered through the slide. And yes, you're still going to get some light scattering, but because um, we have this oil, it's going to help keep everything going up into the um, actual lens. So that gives you a clearer, um, higher resolution image. Okay. Whereas if it hit the air, it kind of scatters a lot more and it's given a poor image. So this question is, why do we use oil immersion with our 100X objective lens? We want to either reduce light scatter, reduce 
illumination, reduce magnification, or reduce contrast. Well, we want to increase our contrast. We want to, uh, it has nothing to do with magnification. So, uh, and then reduce illumination. That doesn't even make sense why we want to do that. So that's our process of elimination that would leave us with A, which is reducing the light scatter. That was increasing our, um, you know, refraction. Decreasing refraction, increasing resolution. Okay, increased resolution. So moving on to contrast. Contrast, um, we talk about refractive index is what we were kind of getting into a little bit with um, the idea of the um, light scattering and all of that. But if we're talking about refractive index, we're talking about a measurement of the degree of contrast of an image. So if you have high contrast, you can see the differences in the cell a little bit better. Um, it will refer to the degree of the bending that light undergoes as it passes from one medium to another. So you want it to be the least amount of refraction. You want to lose the least amount of that light as possible. You want as much as whatever light is hitting your specimen to be going into the lens. That's the idea here, right? That will um, decrease refraction is what you're doing there in order to achieve that. Um, so you're not losing the light, which is what refraction is. You're refracting the light and it's going wherever. Um, so if you can decrease the refraction, you can increase resolution as well as contrast. Yeah. The higher the refractive index, um, the greater the contrast here. So uh, the four types of light microscopes that can exist. Bright field, which is what we use. Dark field, which is what we can see um, here. In this picture, it's literally like the darker background. That's all it is. Uh, phase contrast, which we're not gonna worry about, and interference microscopes, which also we're not gonna worry about. Just really worry about the, my, uh, the bright field. So yeah, bright field and know that dark field exists. Okay, electron microscopy is the next thing. So we can use a focused electron beam. So I told you guys about in chemistry portion, that um, you have electrons that kind of float around the nucleus, which is the, nu um, the neutrons and the protons. Neutrons and protons are significantly larger than electrons. Electrons are so, 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 so tiny, so tiny. So um, you, we can take electrons and just spray them at things and see how they def are deflected by things and then make a picture of how they're deflected essentially. So we use a focused electron beam um, with a six picometer wavelength, wavelength. Um, it's a hundred thousand times less than red visible light. It offers much better resolution. And um, we'll have two types of electron microscopy. There will be transmission and scanning. Transmission is using thin sections, okay? And scanning, just think of you're scanning the surface of something. Um, that's We're gonna use a coated specimen like we see in this. Um, spider picture here is coated with metal. I believe it's gold. And then shooting the electrons at that. And that will give us a clearer image than if we just used that um, particular specimen itself. So that's why we coat it. Um, so it gives a better image of the surface of something. So if we're scanning the surface of something. Um, so this is a pic these are some pictures of transmission electron microscopy. So we're taking sections into things so we can see into like cells or we can see like inside of like a tissue uh, specimen or something like that. Um, looking at um, a nucleus of a eukaryotic cell here, it's just the nucleus. That's a pretty cool picture looking inside what's going on in there. And then we have down here is Ebola. Um, I don't know what everything is, but a lot of these are viruses. I can tell you that this is probably viruses they have coolness. Okay, this is scanning electron microscopy. Um, you can see here, we can see the surfaces of these organisms um, uh, and what they look like on their surface. And then I don't know what this is. I don't know what that is, but it's crazy. And then this is an ant. So this is a video of, um, let's see if I can click on it trying. I'm really trying. I apologize. 
I don't know why I can't click on it, but um, it's literally like these are individual atoms. Okay. Um, and then each of these dots on the screen is an individual atom. And then they made a little movie out of it using atoms, individual atoms, and um, they got to play ball with an individual atom um, using a scanning uh, microscope. So we'll move on from that. Um, I don't know what's going on with that. I can't get to play. I can never get to play whenever I um, do it this way, but that's fine. All right, preparing the specimens. Basically, um, how would you want to prepare your specimen to look at it under whatever microscope setting you're looking at? Uh, you want to consider the condition of the specimen, whether it's you want it alive and to keep it alive, or you want it preserved. Whether and what basically you're trying to do with it? Are you trying to observe it? Are you trying to use it for identification purposes? Um, look at how it moves, and then also whatever type of microscope you might actually have available to you. You might not have an electron microscope available to you. So if you're using fresh living preparations, that's what we would call a wet mount or a hanging drop mount. It's literally using just like if I gave you guys a liquid culture, a broth of some kind that I grew up some bacteria in, and you take a loop full of that grown up broth, put it onto a slide, put a cover slip, which is another piece of glass on top of it, and then just look at it in the microscope. That's a wet mount, okay? You don't do anything special to it usually. The fluid will maintain the viability of the organism and provide a medium for that organism to move if you're trying to look at how it moves around or whether it can move around. And it'll give you a true um, assessment of the size, shape, arrangement, color, and motility of the cells. All right, um, moving on, the smear technique is what we're gonna be doing the most of in the lab. And we will be doing some non um, heat fixed versions as well, but this is the most common one that you guys are going to do. So you usually get a thin film, you get either a liquid suspension or you get like a drop of water and mix like a colony off of an auger um, and then mix it in with the water. Then you let it dry and then you heat fix. You gently put the slide over, pass it over flame in order to fix that crap that you just put on there onto the slide itself and to kill. Um, that. So that's the next part of it. Why do we do the heat fixing to kill the cells, to secure it to the slide? And that will allow us to preserve the cellular components in a natural state with minimal distortion. You can also use alcohol or formalin to um, fix your slides, but we will not be doing that. All right, moving on to the staining. Now you've fixed your slide. You took your sample, you put it on the slide, you heat fixed it, you air dried it, and then you heat fixed it. Um, and now we're going to stain it. Why do we stain? It provides a lot of contrast so we can tell uh, features of the cell apart. Um, we have dyes that will impart color to um, the cells that become affixed to them through whatever chemical sorts of reactions. They could be acidic or they could be basic, depending on whatever we're using. Okay. So you can see clearly that you can see the, the structures of the cells are more visible if you stain cells as opposed to if you don't. We have negative versus positive staining. Uh, positive stain, um, we have a uh, positively charged stain is attracted to the negatively charged cell walls. Remember why are the cell walls negatively charged? Do you remember those um, phosphate head groups that were on your uh, phospholipids in your membranes, right? We talked about those previously. Um, so that's why your membranes are gonna be negatively charged on the outside. So we use a positive stain, it sticks onto the cells themselves. That gives the cells themselves color. Um, and then we have negative stains. They are dyes are repelled from the cell itself. So we get a background that is created and the cells themselves will be standing out. The types of stains that we have, we have simple stains. You just use one dye to look at it, just to give you some contrast, that's all it is. It's very uncomplicated. You just uh, heat fix and then put one color on it and then look at it. And then we have the differential stains. They allow us to see differences in um, either different kinds of organisms or, or actual cells, parts of the cells themselves. Um, they use different colored stains to contrast cell types or cell parts. Um, it's complex. Examples are the Gram stain, the acid fast stain, the endospore stain, the capsule stain, which you guys will be learning in the lab. What is the Gram stain? First of all, the Gram stain was developed about a century ago. It is still a universal diagnostic technique for identifying um, certain aspects of bacteria, whether it is Gram positive 
or gram negative, okay? Um, that will permit ready differentiation of major categories based on the color reaction of the cells. So gram positive bacteria in this stain are gonna stain purple. So I always remember it P and purple. Gram negative bacteria stain red. I think red negative, the color is a little bit more pinkish, but that's not as important. I feel like you should know the difference of positive is purple, negative is red. You'll know what pink or red is. It doesn't, you're not gonna confuse it with purple. Um, moving on to this. So we have a example of simple stains here. We have we just stained some cells with some simple old crystal violet and then looked at what they look like. And down here, methylene blue. Okay. Next we have our differential stains. So we used a gram stain. We see our gram positive cells are in purple, like here and our gram negative cells are the pink or the red. Um, so we can tell the difference between those. Down beneath it, we have the acid fast stain. These pinkish colored cells down here are acid fast. They are acid fast positive. The acid fast negative stuff is gonna be a blue. And we have flagellar stains and um, capsule stains and stuff like that. It's not as important. All right, next we're talking about the endospore stain. This is used to distinguish endospores from vegetative cells. Um, what cells make endospores? And you do have to know this. And I am going to ask you guys about this. Uh, the cells that make endospores are going to be bacillus or clostridium. If, if it's bacillus, anything, bacillus anthracis, bacillus cereus, bacillus subtilis, whatever it is, if it is bacillus, endospores. If it is clostridium, clostridium difficile, C. diff, um, clostridium tetani, tetanus, um, or clostridium botulinum, botulism, and there's other ones too, clostridium perfringens, um, gas gangrene. So anything like that, they're going to have endospores. And so those are the ones that um, if you see that on the test, which of the following might have endospores, you're going to be thinking about um, the bacillus versus the clostridium um, species there. So that's uh, what the endospore stain is going to be for. And this is a slide on the endospore stain and its um, resulting uh, results from the endospore stain. Sorry, he came in and did the trash. I don't know why he still comes in when I'm doing this. Uh, but yeah, just to reprise like that previous slide, endospores, think bacillus and clostridium. You see bacillus and clostridium, I want you to think endospores. Okay, endospores, what are they? They are for preserving um, the organism's uh, like genetic information during harsh conditions. That's all that really is. I mean, they are metabolically, um, the endospores themselves are metabolically inactive. They're not gonna be doing anything, but they are still alive. Yes, they're still alive technically, but they are metabolically inactive. Whenever conditions are favorable again, they'll go back to being vegetative vegetative is the term for whenever they are active and doing things again. Okay. They're like growing and they're multiplying and doing the normal stuff. Okay. This is depicting that whole cycle. Okay. Okay. So, um, this is the endospore stain, right? So this is what would happen in the endospore stain. Basically we stain it with something called malachite green. It is a green dye that we use heat and like steam to force the dye into the endospores themselves. And then um, we will, um, sorry, stain it with red, with saffronin, um, counter stain with saffronin, so that's the secondary stain, um, to stain the cells, the vegetative cells themselves, red. So now we can see the endospores are green and the vegetative cells are red. That's the endospore stain. So that's a differential stain. We can see if something has endospores using this stain. Oh, sorry. Okay, so what sort of microscopes will commonly be used in our laboratory? We will only be using the bright field ones. We don't have electron or um, phase contrast or dark field. So in summary for this chapter, this is chapter three, um, we talked about the five eyes, which is inoculation, incubation, isolation, inspection, and identification. Um, remember inoculating, we're taking a sample and um, growing it up in a sterile media of some kind. Um, incubation, putting it into an incubator, literally, and growing it up. 
isolating. We're going to be like diluting it out or whatever to get individual colonies so we can separate it out and analyze just individual um, species of bacteria. And then um, inspecting, meaning we're doing all these tests and stains and whatever. And then once we have collected all that data, we can identify using that information. So for isolation, we talked about the streak plate. That's probably the one that you need to be um, familiar with the most. Um, selective versus differential. Selective means that certain things are gonna grow on it, other things won't. And differential is gonna be telling the difference between things growing on it, usually from a color change. Light microscopes um, for good magnification, we often use oil immersion because it reduces light scatter. And then electron microscopes use electrons and ultra high magnifications. Those are the highest level magnifying microscopes there are. And then we have staining procedures, which we talked about like the Graham stain and the endospore stain, but there's a lot more that you're gonna learn in the lab. So that's it for chapter three. Um, if you guys have any questions again, of course you can always email me um, or, uh, send a message through canvas, but it's probably better to email me even through canvas is fine. Um, but emails are the best. So, um, yeah, that's that. So I guess that this was chapter three. So we just talked about like the tools of the laboratory and then chapter four, it looks like is going to be prokaryotes, bacteria, stuff like that. So I don't know. Um, doesn't sound as fun to me as this, but um, we'll, we'll get through the not as fun stuff. I'm sure you guys, maybe, maybe you guys think it's more fun. I don't know. I'll see you next time. That's my whole point. Let me go ahead and close out of this and goodbye.